and I will tell them as I would tell anyone. I'm not anti-vaccine. I'm not skeptic. I'm just anti-guinea pig. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when I say he, that will be our illustrious prime minister. People are afraid. And when people are afraid, they're easy to manipulate mm -hmm. and they surrender their civil liberties. Is it in law right now for them to use such mm -hmm. a device? No. Being a, an Englishman yourself, I, I don't know if you've seen, you know? No, well, like you say, I know the English attitude as it relates to people of color. Oh. Views expressed in this podcast are simply the opinions of the guests and the hosts from their perspective. These opinions aren't necessarily facts, nor with the intent to defame any person or establishment. This is not legal, medical, financial, nor spiritual advice. Hey, welcome back. It's the Alternative Perspectives podcast. And today I have um, somebody who seems to, is going to be a, a regular guest. Because, I mean, when I have some pressing topics, I definitely have to bounce it off of him. This is Clark Wills. Indeed. Attorney, uh, attorney at law. Um, and I had to come to him today because I've been seeing some things happening in the country. And I wanted to find out from Mr. Wills, how, how legal are these things, you know, where the Constitution stands, where, you know, are, are, are rights being infringed upon or not? Um, and of course, just recently, well, not even recently, since last we spoke, when we were talking about, like, police killings and whatnot, um, they have had a few other police killings and... One one of them that I definitely want to get into um, is the situation that was surrounding Andrea Barrett, where uh, some people who were supposed to be, I would say, uh, charged or, or even investigated, they happened to die. And the citizens were like, yeah, good job. Good job with the police. So that is something we'll definitely get into. Um, but before we jump in, you know, just... How are things going? I mean, how has COVID and the, the lockdown treat, treated you? I, <clears throat> I've had no difficulty really with the um, lockdowns simply because, as you know, I generally am working most of the time in any event. And because court now is mm. virtual links, I actually am busier because before I would have to manage the day in order to allow myself to get to different locations. Mm -hmm. Now, I can do it from the confines of the um, chambers. So in that respect, it's um, had no effect. Um, not negative anyway. Um, the only difficulty is eating. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's terribly inconvenient yes, that yes. the um, restaurants are not open. But um, oh, that's, that's it. I wouldn't say that it's particularly troublesome, troubling. Okay, okay. Um... Do you, are you a football fan? I used to be. Actually, yes, I used to be. Okay. But since I've been in Trinidad, I've lost touch. So uh, so you weren't rooting for England in the Euros? No. Okay, I, I don't know. I'll just no. ask you. I mean, I know no. being a, an Englishman yourself, I, I don't know if you've seen, you know? No, well, like you say, I know the English attitude as it relates to people of colour. Oh, okay. So I'm very sceptical in throwing my support behind England, especially football, especially football. Football generally has had a reputation for racist rants and behavior for a long time, for a long time. Okay. I think one of the most vocal um, persons against it or about it is John Barnes, you know, the former English player. I listen to him on the subject and I think my sentiments very much are reflected in what he has to say when he speaks to racism. Okay, okay. No, so, um, because I recently spoke to someone else, a big football fan, uh, on the podcast about the some of the racism that came out of um, the, the game, well, after the game, uh, seeing that three, uh, okay. let's say, black people were the people who may have cost, uh, who may have costed England the title. For them to go home with that cup and he was saying he doesn't think especially pertaining to the, this situation because he admits that 
between the US and England, he has had more racist encounters in England. And he say in certain parts of England, it's much worse than, let's say, London and whatnot. Um, so, but would you say that that, that that statement may not be true? Or it, it, do you think that there's a chance that, yeah, the, the racism is real and it's, it's, it's a lot? I'd have to disagree with him because it's a question of degree. Mm -hmm. And without going into a huge discourse about it, you only have to look at the views as expressed by their most recent president, um, Donald Trump. <clears throat> and in my view, mm -hmm. the man was an outright racist. Okay. And he was in power. So he clearly had to have sufficient votes in order to put him there. Mm -hmm. But then when you look at England, I don't know whether one could argue that the current government, government um, is any worse than Donald Trump. It's much of a muchness. I think that what is significant is that in America, it's the police killings as it relates to people of color that's worthy of note because it seems to be the norm, although you have Black Lives Matter and various other political and non-governmental organizations and others who have been ventilating their disgust at the behavior of the police service and its government, the government response to it. But who are we kidding? America was predominantly filled with the Irish who were voted over from England. So it's, you're really looking at English people who have migrated <laughs> to North America right, right. and taken with them that same um, Costa, white supremacist mm -hmm. um, attitude. And you just see it played out. Because America and their Second Amendment with their guns, then it's far more violent or deadly than it is in England, which in my view is England is far more subtle and, but it's there. It's something that in some cases it's obvious and in other cases it's just more institutionalized. Okay. Yes. That's so what as for your experience as a young boy growing up in England, you would say it didn't bother you much or? I have to be grateful for it. I do, I have to be grateful for it because if it wasn't for the way we were treated in the education system, by the police, uh, social settings, then I have no doubt in my mind that I wouldn't be as articulate or as outspoken or as driven as I am. Okay. That I wouldn't take the opportunity to see things for what they are. No, here's here where this is where uh, I'm going to put a little spin on it. What was in in back in England when you were growing up? What was your, your socio-economical status? Now, reason I'm asking, because I think in Trinidad, we have a huge problem with more classism than racism. Um, so what I'm trying to get to is, is it that in England and probably in the US or whatnot, if, if you have money as a black person, you do more likely to accept you or not treat you anyway, or, you know, the... the if you're poor and you're black, well, you know, you understand what I'm saying? Right. England is, I'm thinking, because it seems to be, it permeates through um, Europe in different um, um, countries. It's a class system. Okay. England is a class system. It's steeped in heritage. Um, I don't know that England could be classified as being a cultural place because to me, Trinidad, they don't have a class system in Trinidad. Mm -hmm. Trinidad is steeped in culture. So with a class-based system as England is, no amount of money will allow you or afford you the opportunity to buy in. You can't come to the club if your nouveau reach or if you have it doesn't work like that. Okay. You would have to come from a family that has however many generations of that, you know, the, who are members, and otherwise it's not going to happen. It doesn't work like okay. that. Okay. In America, you have your money. You're in the club. You can buy your way into the club. You just have to have enough money. Trinidad is a, 
and I, it was best summed up in an article that I read in the local press here some years ago when I first came to Trinidad, where it was referred to as a republic colony, meaning that although it had its independence and it's a republic, it still succumbs very heavily to this, the colonial ethos. Right. Mm -hmm. So that, that's why you have the different shades of um, black in Trinidad. Mm -hmm. And you will notice that it's an, almost an unwritten law that people who are high color, as it's referred to, generally get better treatment, right. whether it's been a restaurant, whether it's been a supermarket, no matter where. But what is particularly um, humorous is that the behaviors you see exhibited are across the board. A man could be driving a Porsche or a B13 and let something happen which warrants them feeling aggrieved or offended. And you won't know the difference in them <laughs> when you hear the language and right. the behavior. So Trinidad is not, it's not a class society. It's, a, it's full of, it's steeped, as I say, in culture, although I would argue it's losing it now having regard to its, the American influence. But um, no, they're very different. The social um, demographics, the whole makeup is radically different. Okay. All right. Uh, so now, which leads me into, you know, the situation with we were talking about like the police killings and whatnot. So, for instance, um, I want to go further back before I come forward where uh, this young man, I think they call him Solo or whatnot um, in the Andrea Barrett situation. And they went to, to lock him up. He ended up in police custody. They said he, he, he fell off a chair. And, you know, that's the stuff that's coming out into, uh, I guess, the media. And he died. Um, and then there's the next gentleman who had uh, a bit of uh, charges against him. I think it was 17 or 18 charges against him. And he ended up dying not too long after in police custody as well. And so people, people like, yeah, you know, it's good for them. Yeah, 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 really. And then when they went through the, when they started to process the, the officers and they wanted to charge the officers, I think they charged the officers. People were like, why are they doing the officers that? No. My thing is, most, a, a lot of the people who were saying that were of the same class, the same, well, the same class, the same race, and whatnot as these people. So, you know, and that's, that's why for me, I said, I, I, I you know, I, Trinidad is a kind of funny place. I don't know why. You understand? Is, is, or do you think the media demonize these guys and that, that is why people thought it was okay? When last we spoke, I spoke about, we were speaking mm -hmm. about police killings. And I told you about these extrajudiciary, extrajudicial and um, summary executions. And that people would be sitting back saying, oh, what a great job, Gary. Um, I specifically recall mentioning something like that. We're actually seeing it played out. I think that the media really have a lot to do with that. Although I'm not saying that people ought not to surrender their individual individuality or their um, objectivity. You know, clearly they are, but they ought not to. The media, they don't ask the right questions. Mm -hmm. They appear to be a tool for some and a blight for others. Clearly, if you were reporting that incident, the chap who fell off the chair, supposedly, I'm satisfied that you would have perhaps spoken to medical professionals, exactly, yes. police officers in terms of practice and procedure, mm. and you would have looked at the result that a man falls off a chair that's barely two feet off the ground and sustained multiple injuries enough to, he was in a coma for how long, and then he died, if I remember serves you right. You would have not published that in any way which would support the police version. You would have published that and given rise uh, to the obvious police brutality and the fact that such an activity on the part of the police ought not to be condoned. Now, when you have public coming into the social media, supporting that behavior, I have not heard from any quarter any dissenting call. So it's acceptable. 
So it's being reinforced. So it's being initially sent out on mass media, as in the main media for Trinidad and Tobago. And then outside of that, it's being carried on social media, WhatsApp and Facebook and various others. And no one in mainstream media has come out and said, listen, it is not for the police to decide who lives and who dies. But the, 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 as, and I think I said this the last time, is it that people in Trinidad and Tobago believe that the police should be the ones to, to decide that? No, I, I, what I've realized recently is that a lot of Trinidadians, they don't understand how the law works. They don't understand that the, the, in Parliament and the Senate, they make laws and whatnot, and the police are made to uphold the laws, and then the the uh, the judicial side of it, they you know kind of look over to make sure okay, no, this was wrong, no officer, you should not have done that, or or, and I think people put most of the law on everything in the police hands in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, I don't know if, if you have noticed no, that. No, well, as you well. see, you're quite right. You're quite right. You've happened upon a point that was made properly to me, obvious to me when I was speaking to a note taker as they then were, now they're JSOs, the system's changed. And her attitude was, and this is in the face of absolutely ridiculous evidence, the policeman's evidence in cross-examination defied the laws of known and accepted physics and science. And this note taker was adamant that the chap was guilty, despite the obvious um, flaws, and they were extreme, because the police don't arrest people who are innocent. Well, so, as far as she was concerned, and that's the case with most people, if someone is arrested by the police, charged and brought before the courts, it's because they're guilty. The presumption of innocence is lost in Trinidad. Uh, yeah, but I mean, and you have to hope that they are arrested and charged and not murdered before that could even happen. I mean, <laughs> it, it, you understand what I'm saying? Well, you see, that's the way it's got now. And I told you, no, I didn't tell you, but um, I've said it before. Because there's many police officers in you know, a jocular fashion will tell me, oh, Clark Wills always represented innocent people. And I tell them all my clients are innocent. They're just subjected to a brutal regime. And um, as, a, as such, they're dragged before the courts and they're all innocent. I tell them that. Now, what I think people must understand is that if you don't have checks and balance in place to stop those authorities who are responsible for upholding the law, if you don't stop them from taking the law into their own hands, the perception... So you can imagine, if the perception was, and this is a few years back now, that who the police arrest and bring to court are guilty, the perception is now that the police don't have to arrest you. Mm -hmm. They can kill you. Because from the moment you're in there or on their radar, you're guilty. Mm -hmm. The police actually don't investigate. Most of the um, cases where people are arrested, it's... The word on the street, the talk is, your name's calling. Mm -hmm. You know, that same type of, um, I say, like, because it's just hearsay. It's just rumors. It's what people say. And what the police will do is they'll, they'll come, they'll arrest you. You know, fortunately, you know, if you just get arrested. And then they'll charge you. And they'll tell you in your face, well, let the magistrate decide. You know, let the courts decide. And, and that's the way it works. I do matters when the police will tell you in cross-examination when you ask them. What was the evidence that you relied on to support the charge? You show me, and they can't show you. But is it? Do you think that a uh, great part of it comes also from the government in terms of, like, for instance, how they were begging and crying for the anti-gang legislation? Right? Um, people would say, "Well, if you do your job, you wouldn't really need that. If you do the uh, uh, surveil people and you do the proper investigations." It, you just go on, you, you will get the information in it and you go and hold the person with the anti-gang act. You were trying to use that legislation, based on my opinion, this is how I uh, perceive it or how I see it. Um, you, want to, you want to go and hold people and then do the investigation, the investigating. Yeah. So is it that, you know, 
the, the government with their way of thinking or the people who are in government at times with their way of thinking kind of perpetuates that type of behavior. The government is so far removed from the people. I'll give you a classic example. You will see that if you don't wear your face mask, it's a thousand dollar fine. Mm -hmm. This country has been subject to COVID restrictions, some extremely harsh, you know, state of emergency, you can't be out weekends where you're locked up in your house from 10 o'clock in the morning until five o'clock the following morning. Most people have been working paycheck, you know, living paycheck mm -hmm. to paycheck. So when you shut down the country, people are not working. Mm -hmm. They're not earning. A thousand dollars in this climate is a king's ransom. Mm -hmm. And you're charging people that for not wearing a fast face mask. You will see that the Summary Courts Act has been amended. So people who resist the police, um, who obstruct the police, who, you know, those minor offenses that used to be $200 and these things are now, I think, $250,000 and $50,000. And the rate of inflation in Trinidad, you look at the price of food, how it's gone up. And people's paychecks, although they're not working now, <laughs> but the government workers who are still getting paid, even they, uh, their pay is not reflected in the inflation. So the government is creating these offences, driving offences. Now you have in these demerit points, in England we call them a point system, 12 and you're disqualified. And you look at the types of fines that they're meeting out now for speeding, for parking, for um, you name it. And in no way is there a link between the earning capacity of people at the moment and those types of cases or um, legislation that they're bringing in. This government, any government that does that to its people, can't be said to care about its people. Now, I, I remember having this debate on uh, Facebook, which you probably shouldn't be having debates with people on Facebook, nevertheless. But when they came up with the fine and they said it was $1,000, right? And they were like, because you remember, obviously, um, Farah Salwari, and they, they would have said that, oh, this is, this is done all over the world. So I was like, okay, cool, let me go and check. So I went to check in other countries to see what the, what the fine was, and I went to check to see what the, the minimum wage was yes. in those countries. And the disparity was, was huge. huge yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So basically because in this country, that fine, let's say the face mask fine, is $1,000, which is more than half of, of a salary of a minimum wage worker. Yes. Right? Across, I checked in Australia, Canada, no, in many not, different countries. No, you will not find a comparison. Mm -hmm. You will not find a comparison. Now, here, here, let me give you our next piece of action. Um, I am one of those people who got a ticket for not wearing a face mask. I did. Oh. <laughs> not it. No. Here, this is my my situation. I, I'll tell you my situation. Um, uh, we went to pick up, my wife and I went to pick up our bigger daughter. And... I hadn't eaten since morning. She went to a therapy session and I hadn't eaten since morning. Me being a diabetic, all the restaurants closed. The only place I could have gotten something to eat was St. Christopher's gas station. We went to the gas station, bought pies and whatnot. Started to eat the pies from any gas station, right? We, yeah. So we driving out the gas station, saw some officers by the pump. I don't time to study them. They decided to follow us to uh, the traffic light by the stadium and on the side, you know, pull over. So I like, cool, no problem, pull over. The officer came, well, now we're all your mask. We're eating pie in my hand. The pie is in my hand, right? Well, uh, since in the gas station, he wasn't in. I said, well, when he saw us, I was eating. Because I remember when I saw you, right? I said, we went in the gas station to get something to eat, so we eaten it. We came out of the gas station and started to eat it, right? License and registration, you took it and whatever, and, and they wrote up the tickets or whatever. And I was like, wait, wait, wait. First of all, everybody in this car I live with, we eat ice cream from the same spoon. We like, yep. hey, taste this, yep, yep. right? Everybody. 
On top of that, we are eating. This is in Port of Spain. I live a Rima. As a diabetic, which one you prefer? You prefer I not eat and pass out on the road and kill two, three people? Or you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. And I was like, wow, nah, boy. Like, I, I mean, at that point, I made up my mind that if there's any possible legal way for me to immigrate, I'm gone. Oh, you can't. You see, I, I, but my view is a simple view. I think if you keep doing what you're doing long enough, you get what you deserve. And Trinidad, finally, is well on the way to getting a government that it really deserves. And this government, it does not care. For, for too long, this eat-a-food mentality has prevailed. That I don't care who's in power as long as I get There's something in it for me. So even though, for example, I'm a policeman and I'm paid to do a particular job, as long as I can skim money here or skim money there or my little, um, what's it, what they call it? They, there's an expression, they use hustle here and hustle there. I don't care. Well, it's, the pigeons have come home to roost. You now have a government who clearly, by their behaviour, do not care about their citizens. Now, you have these absolute offences. That would be your curfew, your COVID restrictions, the mask wearing. And Rowley is now making these utterances, his overtures, as if he intends to make the taking of the vaccine mandatory. All of those are indicative of a dictatorship. That's where, that's where you're going. It's a police state now where the police get killing people with impunity. Even when it's caught on video, nothing happens. In fact, to the contrary, public opinion says, yes, the police are doing a good job. Another one, another two, another three, however many gone. Kill them all. People are getting what they deserve. You know, as I say, no, running, not going to help you. Not going to help you at all. I think this is a climate where people who are prepared to stand up and be counted can actually make a difference. No, I think that might be easier said than done in certain situations because I think what we also have in this country is, for instance, for somebody like me who would stand up and talk against these things, when, I mean, funds start to get low from doing something, because these things don't pay as yet, and it take a while before you can get paid from doing yeah. podcasting and whatnot. And like, for instance, I'm, I worked in the media for a while. People, most media companies won't touch me with a 10-foot pole because I oppose what's going on. Yes. You understand what I'm saying? You speak your mind. So in terms of finances, and I think that is where a lot of people are frightened. A lot of people think, well, if I stand up, I could now be victimized. I could now, you know, I mean, when you have the police commissioner coming to write on your Facebook post, People, people live in fear. People are afraid to, to say how they feel about certain things in the country because the police commissioner will attack you on Facebook. Okay. I think, I mean... Okay. What do you do? You know, what do you really do? The human spirit is something that you can suppress it. You can do all manner of things. You can corrupt it. You can try and lose it, but it will always prevail. And what I mean by that is simply this. I took the liberty, there's a book out there called um, Science of God. And it uses, um, because there's two explanations as it relates to the universe. They talk about random or organized. There's everything that takes place. Is there a divine logic or objective? to it or is it just random and you will learn if I just mentioned the um, it's a particular paradox that makes the um, point and it speaks about the um, matter wave paradox and that is that no that's as much you can go and look it up <laughs> the matter wave paradox and my point is simply this I think in a, at a core level at a core level, we will all get to that stage where we for ourselves will know that something is just wrong. And although you're there in as much as you look and you say, well, this is wrong, your question is, do I say something about it? And that question is just predicated on that fight 
or flight mm-hmm. mindset. You know, that's an endemic part of our character. Do we run or do we fight? Because that's what it is. You're sitting down thinking to myself, because you're not thinking what's in it for me. You're thinking, what are the consequences? If mm-hmm. I stand up and I speak, am I going to be victimized? You know, I have children, I have a wife, I have this, I have that. Is it right that they suffer because I want to stand up in the gap and say, no, stop, enough's enough, think. So no, I think that the fact that you're actually having that conversation with yourself is a good thing. <laughs> no, it's a good thing because another person wouldn't trouble themselves. They would just go with the flow. They would not even think for one moment about gain against the grain. This need to be accepted. This need to be a part of society. This need to be seen to be progressive. This need to be um, deemed as one of the boys, one of the girls. You know, that as you they can, say, no, and to be woke. Exactly. <laughs> and I, you can see that we're all, and because we're all, we're society. Whether you decide to stand up in the gap or not, if society goes to hell in a basket, you're not going to be left unscathed. So if you don't stand up and say something and at least try something, if it does go over the precipice, you're going with it. Mm-hmm. So what do you do? <laughs> do you sit down quiet and wait to go over the precipice or do you stand up and say, listen, enough's enough. There has to be this lone voice in the wilderness that, hey, listen, let's try listening to reason here. And until or unless enough people do that, it will be unabated. It will just carry on. It's not about um, pecuniary advancement. and Because if you could have been brought or bribed off, you wouldn't be here. Right. And if you were here, you would be framing questions in a way which will either make me look like a um, madman. It would make me look as if I'm either unstable, um, ignorant, or just some laughing stock. You wouldn't give me the scope or the option, the opportunity to be able to give an intelligible, articulate response to any of the questions. The questions would be random and wild and just, it would be absurd, it would be complete farce and it would be presented as a complete, complete farce. Right, yes. you know, we spoke to Clark Wills, that attorney represents all those criminals. <laughs> this is what he had to say. <laughs> but no, so you're doing your part. Each person has to just do their part. You can't do it for anybody else. The most you can do is give the message. Okay. What they do with it, entirely up to them. I mean, and that is what I, I try to focus on at this point. I'm putting the information out there. So even if you don't listen now, at some point you could come back and say, oh my. See how many years ago he yeah. was saying that? Yeah, right? Yeah. Because I mean, recently, you know, I was watching uh, something on, um, on News Before News on the social media sites. Okay. Um, you know I don't watch social media, you know that, okay, don't you? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a, a, a young man who they, they claim, I think he tried to rob a, 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 a he tried to attack um, a plain clothes police officer, right? Um, Naza, I think, was the name. And the police officer shot him, he died and whatnot. So I started to reach out to some people right to find out about the individual um just like with the andrea barrett situation i I reached out to people who knew the solo guy and or people who knew of him and yeah okay now what type of person the person really was do you think he was capable of doing something like this you understand and um i think you 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 knew the nasa guy i knew him very well he worked for me for years (laughs) okay Right, <laughs> it will. And um, so I, I reached out to some people. Uh, I even reached out to a police officer as well, um, who knows, who doesn't know him personally, but knows of him. Right, and everybody was like, "Nah, he's not the no, type not of him. person. No, yeah, not him. That's right, not him." Yeah. So and obviously, look what's going on with his situation. I don't think we're going to hear. Oh. Anything contrary to what was put it really, out. The media has to take responsibility until we get to the stage where you have sensible reporting. And I think I've seen a few, um, and to my shame, I can't recall their names, but I've seen a couple, not many, who actually try to get to the truth. They actually ask those probing questions. And you don't see them often. And 
they because we don't get unbiased and objective reporting because even if you because you don't have to actually give your view mm -hmm. you just have to present the facts but if you just speak to the police which is generally what happens you just speak to the police and they they always control the narrative they get their story out first and public opinion falls behind the police well they're doing their job and you know if they say he was this then he must have been that and that's it whereas if the media were to present not the police view but the facts on both sides then let the people decide you don't have to give it a narration you don't have to steer it it's from the moment the media houses are controlling the narrative then that smacks of um, biasness. It's but just the, the, not... I think where it comes from, I, me, I've worked in the media, well, I've worked in the media for 13 years, more than 13 years, a bit more than 13 years, and I think where that comes from is lazy journalism. Um, there are very few journalists who, who are willing to pick up and go to find out a story. So a lot of journalists will sit down and wait for a... Uh, uh, um, a, a police release. It had, a, it had one they used to send every day. The police used to send a, a, a release every day where um, Sergeant Meister, and when, back when Sergeant Meister was around, as a sergeant, I should say, and they would sit down and, and yeah. the police press, I think they used to call it, every day they would send and they would say, this happened and this happened and this happened and then the journalists would sit down and they would write yeah. their story based the on that. Yeah. And that's it. Bum, bum, bum. And that's it. It goes on. There are very few journalists um, who are willing to, to say, well, no, nah, I, I go in and dig. But, like, for instance, um, Mark Bassant, I don't know how you feel about him either way, um, but I knew, I knew he was somebody who, who used to do that. Um, actually, anyway, I didn't want to get into that because I don't know the legal ramifications and that, but, right? So, but I know he was he was one of the people who, who used to do that a lot and I haven't heard anything about him or from him in a while, but... He's been silenced. Yeah. But you see, where, where we are now, we have, and I remember we touched on it last time um, about the COVID. And back then we spoke about the lawfulness and legality of people not being able to get back to Trinidad and whether or not the government was being responsible with that. And indeed, whether or not the government's responsible for its citizens who are caught outside. Now, um, back then I told you, we're not going to have the discussion as to whether or not COVID is real or not, mm. but we were just going to look at the government's response um, to that. Now, my view is, um, I think, well, I know, my view is based on the science of it, and I've taken the opportunity to listen to the scientists who speak to the COVID. Now, I don't say that I listen to what a scientist says, in isolation. Right. I listen to what he says based on the science he relies on to support what he says. So I'm not going to believe a scientist because he calls himself a scientist. I will believe him if he is an entomologist, a virologist, you know, a scientist within that mm -hmm. sphere. And he can show me the science that he relies on for his prognosis or for his conclusion as it relates to where we are. What I can say is that what at the moment is irrefutable and um, immutable is that there is a above 99% recovery rate for COVID. That we know that 80% of people are asymptomatic. Now, my understanding of that means that 80% of people will get COVID, recover from it, and never know they had it. So, if the recovery rate is so high, if the vast numbers of sperm the population will have it and never know they had it, why am I taking an experimental injection for something that my natural immune system will have a 99% combat. chance of beating. I'm more likely to win the lotto than die from COVID. In fact, 
I think there's a greater chance of me being struck by lightning I think twice or three times. I'm trying to remember what the statistics were. I, mean, I can't remember if this was for England or for Trinidad, but the statistics were you were more likely to get struck by lightning three times than win the lotto. So with that said, we're more likely to get struck by lightning at least once than die from COVID. Why am I taking an experimental injection for that? That makes no sense. I listened to um, the illustrious Prime Minister speak about uh, COVID and he gives the country the impression that once everybody, this herd immunity that he speaks about, and I'll leave that there mm. because I, I don't want to come across mm. as uh, political because I, I, I have no political allegiances as you know, but we look, look at his language. He gives the people the hope that if everybody gets vaccinated, the country can go back to normal. Trinidad is not going back to what it was pre-COVID. It's not going to happen. So whatever people envisage as normal, they need to disabuse their minds of that. That's not going to happen. There are some businesses that have closed their doors forever. Yeah. Their, you know, the landscape has changed both in Trinidad globally. You know, the financial markets are in a mess and the knock-on effect of that is coming to come. Anyone who believes that COVID is finishing this year, I don't know what planet they're living on. It's not going to happen. Not going to happen at all. Knock-on effects for COVID, for COVID and you're going to feel those ramifications for years. Giving the people the false hope that being vaccinated is some cure is just a flagrant untruth. I, well, I think I think it's, it's politics. I think, but you see, listen to the science. If you take the vaccine, it doesn't stop you from getting COVID. Exactly. It doesn't stop you from carrying COVID. Mm -hmm. It doesn't stop you from spreading COVID. So me telling you that taking the vaccine is going to eradicate COVID is a lie. The people who are giving you the injections, supplying the injection, injections, that's what they're telling you that. That it's not going to stop you from getting it. Not going to stop you from spreading it. Gonna, and as for, it's ridiculous when I see these people walking around with these pathetic face masks on. Mm. It makes no sense. Now, you touched on it earlier. You would leave the house with the people whom you occupy the house with. And it's not as if everyone's in quarantine in their separate little um, rooms, walking around with their PPE suits. And no, you're living in the house together. You cannot sit in the car together without a face mask. Okay. You cannot walk on the street by yourself <laughs> without a face mask. That's insanity. And what makes it insane? is because there is no scientific proof anywhere to suggest that a face mask stops you from catching COVID, carrying COVID, or spreading COVID. You're looking at a virus. A virus is infinitely smaller than bacteria. Mm -hmm. You need a proper you know, like a hazmat suit. You yeah. see the US Army wearing mm. them for chemical weapons warfare. That's dealing with viruses. Those little fashionable icons that people want to be wearing offer no protection. That's the science. But I mean, even what Dr. Fauci he admitted it in an email, you know, when they, when they got into his emails through the um, Freedom of Information Act yep. in the US, he was telling somebody, yo, these face masks are really and truly not going to help you and not going to do anything. Yeah, makes no difference. Right? Um, and I, I believe he told Trump that. Yeah. And Trump knew. And so that's why Trump behaved the way he did. And Trump didn't play the political game. Because that's one reason I, I like Trump. Because he don't play the political games. No. Right? No, no he doesn't. No. Would I have voted for Trump? Probably not. If I, You know, if I was there. But he, as I say, he doesn't play the political. And I think that is what went on. No, I mean, as you're on the COVID topic and you hinted slightly on the um, getting vaccinated and whatnot and 
kind of twisting people's arms, not making it mandatory, but kind of make it like where you have employers saying, if you have no vaccine, can't they can't come to work. Come to work. Yeah. Is that even legal though? Of course it's not. Do you know that subject to um, at least one conve convention that stops outright experimental um, ex uh, medicines being um, given to people? And there is no legislation at all in Trinidad that will support what he's saying in terms of trying to coerce or force people into taking an experimental medicine. You see, on what basis can you do that? It's mainly emergency legislation that they're relying on right. at the moment, but that emergency legislation if he were at this stage to try and employ that legislation to force people to take an experimental uh, medicine, I think he'll be in trouble. However, I dare say this, if you look at the four or five African leaders who died recently, um, I think from about January up until the chap in Haiti, the one thing they all had in common was that they had all refused to follow the um, COVID agenda. Now, what they say makes someone a conspiracy theorist is something that can be summed up by using the law. If I steal something from you and I'm caught, I get charged for larceny. If I try to steal something from you and I get caught, I get charged for attempted larceny. If I plan to steal something from you and I, you know, someone's got a wire on them, whatever the case may be, I'm charged for conspiracy. Conspiracy, um, and as a prosecutor, I can tell you, when I was in England, I was a prosecutor. Conspiracy is when you're scraping the barrel. Mm. You don't have any evidence mm. that the person you know, actually did the mm. thing. You don't have any evidence that they tried to do the thing, or attempted rather. But you just know something. You know, it, it, they have to be involved. You know, the company they keep, you know, something. Mm. No, they're up to no good. So you charge them for conspiracy. You're scraping the barrel when you charge someone for conspiracy. The point being is when you call someone a conspiracy theorist, what you're saying is that, in essence, their utterances or their rants are baseless. There's, you know, there's nothing to mm -hmm. it. It's just sheer puff. You, you can't believe them. They're just conspiracy theorists. When someone can substantiate what they're saying through the science, does that make them a conspiracy theorist? No. <laughs> No. Okay. But you say anything at all, remotely, that could be implied that you are telling people that don't take the vaccine, you become labelled a conspiracy theorist because it's what it engenders. People think, oh, yeah, they're just conspiracy. No one then listens to what you say. It's an easy way of discrediting or rubbishing what someone has to say by just labelling them a conspiracy theorist. I've listened to many um, people speak on the subject, I've read many articles, and these people are reputed, renowned scientists. And when they try, for example, that Nobel Prize laureate, I can't pronounce his name, when he said that COVID, the likely root of COVID is that it was created or it was manipulated um, mm -hmm. in a lab, they tried to rubbish him. Mm -hmm. They tried to discredit him. So he went away, he did his research proper, wrote a paper. That paper is now, as they, it's relied on, as the most likely cause mm -hmm. of it. But when he first said it, the man was labelled a quack, a conspiracy theorist. He goes away, does the science, and he comes back. Although they rely on his paper, when his name's mentioned, People only talk, oh, well, he's a conspiracy, theor conspiracy mm. theorist. He's a quack. So you pick and choose what you want 
as it suits your agenda. I have to be really mindful how far I go when I speak about um, COVID. And I don't know why people use the term vaccine, because I think even Pfizer and whoever else are now saying, listen, it's not a vaccine because it does not fall within the definition of a vaccine. So it's experimental gene therapy. But we don't call it vaccine. The media does. Oh, OK. Everyone else calls it a vaccine. Mm. And we don't tell them, listen, it's not a vaccine. Mm. So, you know, you put it out there, you call it a vaccine, you get challenged um, that um, John F. K. John F. Kennedy, I think his name is, um, he's got a strange voice, American chef, who's a total um, people's person. You know, he's really for the people. And they sued the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and successfully because they were unable to prove that the vaccines were safe. And from then it was no longer, you know, the vaccine part of it is lost and blah, blah, blah. But it's already in the media. So what you associate with the vaccine is that it's helpful. It's good for you. We need a vaccine because vaccines have been about for years. Although you would have to look at the data in terms of their effectiveness in places like Africa, for example, or India. But, you know, that aside, there is a public perception that a vaccine is good for you. So if I call something which is experimental a vaccine, the public perception is it's good for me. Never mind that you would have scientists who were engaged in the development of the RNA therapy who will tell you that the animal subjects or those experiments were catastrophic failures. Now, when you hear the term catastrophic in those um, circumstances, that's a way of saying that the test subjects died terrible deaths, that they all died. That's what it simply means. So, you know, instead of saying, well, they all died a very painful death, you say it was a catastrophic failure. You know, that expression covers a multitude of sins. Mm. You're now at a stage where people are taking it. And is it coincidence that you didn't really have um, these many deaths, having 900, how many deaths they've had now? I can't remember. I saw it briefly. Is it a coincidence that people started dying in numbers once they started rolling out the vaccine? Or is there a connection there? I don't know. <laughs> well, what, what I should say is I have my view. Right. My view is based on um, the research that I have done because it's not hard. Most of the government websites have the information there. Because the information is actually not hidden. Because anything hidden in plain sight actually isn't hidden. It's there for anyone who would be prepared to look at it. I have a view. Because I've spoken to people who I would normally attribute a, a level of intellect and free thinking. And when I hear that they have been queuing up to take the um, injection, and indeed, some have taken it. I'm a bit surprised. And when I mm -hmm. ask them about it, they tell me these things like, you know, well, I think they're going to make it mandatory to travel, and I like to travel. Oh, I want the country to open back up. Oh, I want Carnival to come back. And, and, I, think, uh, I, and I just think to myself, well, you know, you actually aren't making any sense because you all know that once it's done, it can't be undone. Right. And, you know, and that's not a hidden fact. That's a fact. Once it's done, it can't be undone that you have over a 99% chance of recovery. That once you take it, it doesn't stop you from getting it. What they do say is not that it, it will stop you from getting it, not that it will stop the um, symptoms from being so extreme, not that it will stop you from dying. What they tell you is it may. Right. Mm -hmm. It may do this. It might do that. It ought to. It should. You know, vague terms. So no one, and remember, on top of that, as is common knowledge, the manufacturers are indemnified. Yeah. If your product is so good, why do you need an indemnity? Mm -hmm. I will give you this product, but you as a government must first indemnify me. And you have literature out there that speaks to the inherent harms of some of these ingredients. Now, you find me someone that can tell you as a matter of fact, what the ingredients are and what the ingredients do. 
Most people don't know. You ask what's in it. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> but they're running out there to take it. But uh, but t- to be fair though, I think to be fair to a lot of the people, I think people who place in a place of fear. Um, and I have been saying this a while now. Every, nearly every time you hear the Prime Minister speak on, on one of those press conferences, you know, he would make it, he, he would say, um, we well, want to go online by the bar and we'll be moving you all from, from the bar to the ICU or we'll be moving you all from the bar to the morgue. Right? And I was like, that is disingenuous. Exactly. Because if 99% of the people who get it survives, and we, we let's just say there's about 100 people by the bar. That's a lot of people. Right? Because I don't want to say 10. Because if it's 10 people by the bar, that means is is No, it's actually the uh, mathematical equation it's one in a thousand. Okay. So you'd have to have a thousand people in the bar right. before one person we'll without um, any vaccine, without any intervention. One in a thousand. Right. So a thousand you would have to be at the bar and it will be probably poor old granny, you know, who's probably celebrating her 99th birthday. Who's the, pro- who's the person who's likely to succumb to it? Or someone who has a pre-existing hardcore respiratory right. problem. You know, someone who has some latent issue is the person who's most likely to succumb to it. Most everybody else, worst case scenario for most of everyone else who fall into, remember 80 of, 80% of us are gonna walk in there, walk out, and never know we had it. Right. So you're really looking at the other 20% who we're gonna exhibit symptoms. And within that 20% from like the thousand, one person is gonna go out on a stretcher never to be, never to be mm. seen again. So when you tell people that, geez, if you want to live, stay home. If you want to live, stay in care, wear your mask. You know, go and get your vaccine. Go on. on what basis? The people, the last figure that I looked at, and that was months ago now, was 67% of people that were testing positive with COVID had a full course of treatment, which suggests that most of the people are getting COVID. Uh, the people that have been vaccinated to stop themselves from getting COVID. Mm. So how do you mar that up with the need to take the injection? You know, on that statistic alone, and I'm setting the figures higher now, the people who haven't been vaccinated are less likely to get COVID <laughs> than the people that are vaccinated. <laughs> You'll remember you heard this um, chap speaking about erectile dysfunction. Right. Mm-hmm. And... Have you heard anything about that since? No. Right. He, you will remember the climate back then. Back then, if, um, they had reached a stage where they were offering black people in America drugs mm-hmm. to take it. Then they were offering them um, money. Money, to take the it. food. Yeah, food. Um, and then you had this chap who had this erectile dysfunction saying that he got COVID and he couldn't get his willy up anymore. And he's the only person that you've ever heard say that. You haven't heard that from anyone else. And mm-hmm. it was a black man. And with that, you saw these black men in their droves mm-hmm. queuing up to get it. And then that was rubbished. That was rubbished. I think there was a few scientists that came out and said, well, actually, the likelihood of you suffering from erectile dysfunction is increased once you take the vaccine. You know, it's like, <gasps> everyone's like, <"Bruh." laughs> And in some Caribbean countries, they're often you land to take it. In America, they're now offering you reduced prison sentence. You know, you you won't go to jail if you take the vaccine. And they're offering it to people in jail. You know, they're offering people, you know, will you get early release if you have a vasectomy or a hysterectomy or you um, take the vaccine. Why are they so intent on having black people take the vaccine? Mm. And you've got to ask yourself this. Although I use the term vaccine, it's not a vaccine, it's gene therapy. But when I say vaccine, everybody knows what I'm speaking about. You have to ask yourself, you know, a simple question. When has it ever been the case that um, so-called civilized society has ever been so keenly interested in the welfare and benefit Mm -hmm. of black people? It's never. (laughs) Let me put that difference between it, right? If you're hungry, right, do they have to bribe you to eat? (laughs) <laughs> only if the food's not good for me <laughs> right when people start to bribe you to do something yeah right you're going on 
people trying to, to do all different other things in life. Gain education, get houses, yeah. and they don't even bribe them yeah. to do those things. Yeah. Right? But, they, but So, when I, I saw that, I was like, yo, 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 hold on. <laughs> when we reach the stage of bribery, something's not right. Something a little fishy here. Yeah, something's not right. Yeah. But who, you know, that, that is so obvious. And yet, people, see, see, listen, the people I was referring to earlier who I think are right minded people and they take it, my view is that that is their way of enforcing their desire to be or accept the social contract. Now, the social contract that obtains in places like North America and, and Europe, for generations, it hasn't applied to black people. That's why you have the institutionalized racism. That's why you have the black people who are seen as second class citizens. That's why you have immigration laws predominantly to prevent black people from coming into the country, black people from traveling, black people getting the jobs, black, you name it. They have to have these quotas in order to try and offset the institutionalized racism. So you must have so however many black police officers. You know, if you have a company that's this size, you must have at least one or two black, you know, all of this. Mm -hmm. Imagine, you have to create these positive laws in order to offset racism. Laws are not going to change racism. Not going to happen. Yeah. So, my view is that when you have black people who run to take the vaccine, I think it's them trying to say, well, you know, we are a part of society. Oh, okay. You know, the social contract mm-hmm. applies to us. We want to integrate. We want to be a part of your white society. Now, I think that history has shown what white Caucasians' view is on that. And I really don't need to go further than that. Um, Save to say that any black person that believes that they can buy their way into the club by observing the rules of this social contract that doesn't apply evenly across the board at all, they're just misguided. And if you're someone who's educated, then it's stupidity. And I call it stupidity because where we are now with this so-called information highway and the ease of information on the internet, for someone to be ignorant in this day and age, it's a choice. It's not by accident. Right. It's not as if you have to go and root out and source these books. Or, you don't have to do that. It's on your fingertips. And if you choose to be ignorant, then you're stupid. You're not ignorant. You're <laughs> stupid. And if people want to die because of their stupidity, then you can't help them. You can't help stupid people. An ignorant person, you can help them. You can give them enlightenment. Mm-hmm. You can encourage them to learn. But those who um, are subject to the Kru Kruger effect, that's to say that they don't know what they don't know. No, they don't. And they don't want to know. You can't help them. You let them go and buy in to their social contract. You let them go and take their injection because they want to travel. You let them take their injection because they want to go and work for KFC or they want to go and work for Mario's. You know, it must be a job for life. Stupidity. But, I mean, I, I think it's unfair to say that. I mean, because... Okay. No, because, let's, let's be real. Some How of these is it people, unfair? Some, some of these people, right? If that was their, their only job or... I mean, let us look at the extent of the, the, the lockdowns. The, yeah. the extent of the lockdowns... Crippling. It, exactly. It was crippling and it made people desperate. Yes. And if they tell it, this is the only way you can eat, is either they, they, they do that or you basically end up by the road. I'll go so far to say, okay, for instance, some people, they were doing, they were selling food from home, yep. which, which is illegal. Yeah. Right? They made that illegal. No, no, I've been to many people's houses to buy food, you know, from someone's back door or bedroom mm-hmm. window. I can't cook. <laughs> <laughs> you can only eat so many pack noodles. Yeah. So, so you see, so, and this is what I said, the, the, the extent, because nobody else locked on was as bad as I was. I know. Right? I mean, I know why Canadians are willing to accept these things, but then, you know, even in the States, I, I tell people this, in the States, when they had their lockdowns, they had Amazon that you could have bought clothes and shoes yeah, yeah. And, 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 and appliances if you needed. Yeah. Um, 
all the delivery services were open and whatnot. So you still had the opportunity to get food, to get stuff if you need, right? No, then obviously you could have still, if you decide you want to sell food, you want to make food and sell, you could have, you could have done that. If you decide, okay, I'm going to go on eBay and buy something cheap and go back and sell it on Amazon, right? There were many different ways that people could generate have- Generate income. Right, generate income. In this country, no. where they made it as bad as that, and then they come and they say, no, listen, no vaccine, you're not getting to work. A lot of people probably so far back on bills. At this point, they think if they don't take the vaccine, they might still end up dying from hunger. You know what I'm saying? So here we're going on. I prefer to take the chance and take the vaccine and go back out to work. And even if I have ne- some sort of negative effect two years down the road, at least my belly full. You know what I'm saying? Because let's be real, and I don't want to make it sound like I'm putting anybody down. But a lot of the people who work in these jobs, they're just trying to see the next month. You know? They're just trying Listen, to see. I accept a lot of these people and I made the point of saying they live paycheck to paycheck. Right. I personally couldn't see the logic in closing down the curbside delivery, the drive through things like that. It just beggared belief. But what stopped the people? Because right now, the people who are feeling it the most, it's a broad section of society. Mm-hmm. It's not just peculiar to one section of society. What stops them from organizing and saying, listen, enough's enough? In, in Trinidad, I would say two things. The, the part of society that is, that is being affected, they are not the, the, the part of society who is ever heard. And they are also the part of society that when they act out, you have the other part of society that talk down against them, that put them down. So, you understand what I'm saying? I'll tell you why I disagree with you. Mm. I made the point of saying it's just not peculiar to one section of society. Well, uh, the the thing is, uh, for instance, a lot of government workers still have their jobs or or they still get a salary. They're getting a salary, but they're now having to look after auntie, granny, brother, their own children, the people within the household. You know how many people have been dispossessed and, you know, they can't afford their rent, the landlords put them out, they have to go back home. And you might have a government government work within the family. That one person will be supporting the whole family. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not peculiar to just one section of society. You would have people who would hitherto have referred to themselves as quite well off. Mm-hmm. You know, they could be small business owners, medium-sized business owners. You go down to um, West Mall, um, Trin City, you go to any of those malls where these people still have to pay their rent, and those malls have been closed. You see how many vacant spaces you see there. Those people, they're feeling it. All right, so that's one of my points. And the second point is, when the people in power... um, they put a narrative in that in a way that if you oppose this, you are unreasonable, you are subversive. Exactly. You are a danger. Exactly. You're creating the risk. So, You're perpetuating the state of affairs. How many people will sit down and listen to that and look at someone else and think, well, that's that person. They're not Simply put, you will listen to that and you will look to victimize someone. You're not going to sit down and think, wait a minute, these people are talking absolute rubbish. How am I putting people mm-hmm. in danger? Mm-hmm. You, know, you tell me on the science, because that's what happens, people lose sight of the science. When politics and science mesh, the science always comes off worse. It always suffers mm-hmm. as a result. So instead of common sense prevailing, it's this emotive language mm-hmm. that people hear. So you're telling me that my failure to wear that pathetic mask, to stay inside, to um, social distance, and do the science on social distance. You will do the research on it. You'll see about these six feet. That's absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. All of these things people are saying. And scientifically, it's not supported what's being said. And people, instead of thinking that, they're looking, thinking, mm-hmm, 
so-and-so didn't get vaccinated. Oh, I heard so-and-so, I saw them in their garden not wearing their mask. That's what people are thinking. And that's not stupid. No. For instance, uh, one of the, the, the quotes that almost drives me mad was when the that's Prime Minister the... said um, the, un, the unvaccinated will be threats. No, there's another one. He said you've got to vaccinate to something. And do vaccinate to operate too. That's it, vaccinate no, to operate. But no, the vaccinate to operate... Uh, I didn't be done with that one. No, no. You see, the, you see the, because... Yeah, here, yeah, here, yeah. Here. Listen, you see, mm. what you don't know is what's coming. When you do the science research as it relates to the long-term and not so well medium to long-term effects of the experimental gene therapy that they're giving people, you will understand why you are hearing what you're hearing. Because when people are then exposed to the garden variety, um, COVID, you're going to get an autoimmune response. Mm. Now, for people who haven't under, understand what that means, it's very easy to just look it up and you'll find out what that means. So you are going to have a terrible state of affairs looming in the not too, well, it's looming, so it's not in, not, in the, in the too, not in the too distant future. And in order to saddle the blame on somebody, it will be the non-vaccinated. And that's not supported by the science. No. But we are so far down that rabbit hole that people aren't looking at the science anymore. They're just listening to the rhetoric. And I was... An incident was recounted to me on Charlotte Street. The man cycling on his bike. And as he cycled past the maxi taxi, the man in the front seat sneezed or um, yawned, or whatever the case may be. And the man on the bike stopped and started to cuss the man in the maxi because as far as he's concerned, him having his mask under his chin and sneezing or yawning is um, what has the country where it is, that he's a danger, that he's trying to kill him. And mm. blah. So Trinidad being Trinidad, the man in the maxi played him out a piece of his mind and the maxi pulled off and the man pursued the maxi to engage in a physical altercation with the front seat passenger of the maxi over that. I was in the phone shop, I think about a week ago, and it's a phone shop I frequent often. And I was there chatting to the young lady behind the screen with my mask in my hand, because I really, if you can tell me, I can understand why people wear a mask, but in this climate, a $1,000, a bit much. But scientifically, there's no basis for it. So I'm not going to wear a mask because if you gain, if you do your research, you'll see that the constant use of that mask and people wear it for mm -hmm. hours without mm -hmm. washing and so on and so forth, you will affect your respiratory problem, um, your system, mm -hmm. and also it will drive down your immune system. So if you weren't going to get a flu or a bug or a COVID, you keep wearing that mask. You will get it. Mm -hmm. So this chap comes in, and it was um, during the Euros, and there were a couple of chaps sitting in there quite happily watching the football, minding their own sweet business. This man walks in and he sees me. And I hear this voice. Put your mask on. You ain't hear what your prime minister said. People like you making the COVID spread. Were you trying to kill us? Blah, blah, blah. So I actually didn't realize it was me he was speaking to <laughs> until um, the young lady behind the counter kind of looked at him and then looked at me. I said, I think he's speaking to me. She said to me, yes, I think he is. So, and I look at him. And you could see he's almost indignant to the point where you could see he's contemplating perhaps some physical altercation. And the two men who are watching the football, at this stage, they've stopped watching the football and they're looking at the man and looking at me. And you could see the look at their face like, hmm, this is going to be, <laughs> something's going to happen. So I said to the young lady, well, I should take my leave now. Do you take care? And the man said, well, put on your mask and this, blah, 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 blah. And I said to him, I was leaving, put on my mask. I said, hmm, I did noted. And I left. But you see, that mentality is the tip of the iceberg. Mm. You will see that played out more and more. And when it gets to the stage, and it will, 
where those people who have been vaccinated realize that they've been duped and they get angry and they're looking for somebody to blame. Who do you think they're going to blame? Well, for one, the unvaccinated people, because yeah. they were told that those people are the threats. And, yeah. and my thing is, as a prime minister, I think making a statement like that is pretty dangerous. It's not dangerous. It's negligent. Right. It's negligent. reckless. Yeah, right. And, and I remember telling people, because people said that, that a lot of statements Trump made was dog whistling to white supremacists, right? Yeah. I see. So technically, that is dog whistling to to vaccinated people to yeah. attack unvaccinated people, yes. whether it be physically, um, verbally. It could be in the workplace, in the terms of you know you can't come to work, mm-hmm. and you've seen it played out. Mm-hmm. And it's playing out. And yep. You know, wait. We, we <clears throat> I heard someone recently. Um, they asked me a question. I have this client. The client, it's like a, a personal service thing that they provide to them in people's houses. The client says that they won't, they don't want anyone who's not vaccinated in their home. Can they do that? Why can't they? Mm-hmm. Look where we've reached. It's another form of discrimination now. Mm-hmm. And I mean, you know. And it's sanctioned by the government. Mm-hmm. It's in fact promoted by the government, created by the government. And now we have radio stations buying into this rhetoric. So we have like the, the entire Ojo yep. family pressing this and we talk about radio announcers yep. ridiculing people or shaming people yep. for, for not, not taking it. Yeah. And I'm like, wow. Yeah, look we've reached. We are going down a dangerous road here, Trinidad. Going down, we're down that road. Listen, we're so far down that road, I guarantee you. It's a, it's, listen, it's at a stage where if you... I mean, the country should open up in some respects on the 19th. You listen to the topic of conversation that people have, and you're not going to meet many people that are going to stand up, defy and say, I'm not taking any vaccine. Mm-hmm. You're not going to meet people like that. If you want to meet people who are not taking the vaccine, go to the ghetto. Mm-hmm. Because their social contract with society has been breached for so long, yeah, yeah. you know, because they're the ones who've been brutalized by the state for years. They're the ones that they can't get the right school or the right job because of their postcode. They're the ones who the police are killing. They're the ones who the police are giving bad drug um, cases to. They're the ones that the police are taxing. So they don't care. The government can jump high, the government can jump low. They don't care because nobody cares about them. For long, for how long have they been living in squalor? open drains, open sewers, mosquitoes killing him left, right and centre, rats, cockroaches, all the brutality that's associated with it, poor lighting. And now you want to tell me you care about me so much, I must take this vaccine. Not happening. Not happening. The so-called higher echelons of society, they were the first people to run and get it. Right. All those people down in the West, they ran and got it. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm happy for them. Mm-hmm. You know, I am, I'm happy for them. I think they call I call it death by stupidity. Mm-hmm. Well, leave them to it. But you will see that you're not going to have to tell anyone that, listen, I really don't think that this makes sense. Because word would have spread that, you see him? Mm-hmm. He is one of them anti-vaxxers. Mm-hmm. And that, but I get that. People, when they meet me, would meet me with, oh, Clark Wills, the anti-vaxxer, the sceptic. And I will tell them as I would tell anyone, I'm not anti-vaxxing. I'm not sceptic. I'm just Mm (laughs) anti-guinea pig. You test it. You do all your human trials. You show me the benefit of taking it. And I'll take it. Once it is supported by the science, I'll take it. If you're saying that my over 99% natural immune system can be boosted by that extra 0.3%. Okay. And it's not going to compromise or affect my natural immune system? Yeah, okay. But you can't show me that. What you can show me is 
people bleeding through their eyes, people brain bleeding, people's hearts enlarged, people suffering from deep brain thrombosis, people suffering from those um, autoimmune responses, people taking it today, dead within a week, young, old, infirm, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Why would I do that? You show me the science that this thing is healthy, safe, productive, and necessary, I'll take it all day long. The funny thing is, people would call somebody an anti-vaxxer, right? But the person they call an anti-vaxxer would have had three, four different vaccines. Yeah, I did. Right? Going to school, I had them. Exactly. And when I first came to school, we had to have them. And my thing is, I, I think some people are not anti-vaxxers. And, or, they, they just find that they need more time, more evidence, more science with this yeah. before they make the decision. And I could never give anybody wrong for wanting that. Because, no, but to be fair, there are some people who walk in a room and buy any car. Yeah. And then there are some people, now. Nah, I need to, to know yeah, go with gas mileage. Yeah, exactly, yeah. right? So, yeah. I, I guess th there are different types listen, of people in I life. can forgive anyone who says, listen, I don't know. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I've seen the research left, right and center. And I really don't know. I don't know if it's safe or if it's not safe. So I tell you what, give it 18 months. Mm. If in 18 months it proves itself, okay, then I'll take it. And you get a few people like that. Right. Who say, yeah. listen, I don't know. But what I do know, let time run, let's see the effect that it has. And if it proves beneficial, if it proves healthy, right, and that indeed it does redress the um, pandemic. And as I say, when you look at the Office of National Statistics in um, England and various other countries that speak to the amount of people that died over the so-called COVID period, you'd have expected to have seen an increase in deaths, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's all I'll say there, because the information is freely available. Right. So, be that as it may, show me the benefit, scientifically, factually, okay. One one more thing I want to touch on before um, we go, you know, normally we had to touch on some car things. And I realized recently, I saw in a video locally that the police brought in some scanners, some scanners these whole car scanners, right? Um, I'll, I'll tell you why, you know, I think it's a concern to me, not right now, but what could possibly happen in the future, but is, that, is it in law right now for them to use such no. a device? No. And that's a conversation I had recently with a colleague of mine. So you have this x-ray scanner. Um, I don't think it's x-ray, because, you know, x-ray, those rays are dangerous. Um, I'm not familiar with the technology, but in any event, it gives you an x-ray view of um, cars, its occupants, and in some respects, its contents. Where I have not seen law that supports that, unless, of course, they're going to try and slip it in um, as, you know, photography type thing. But Trinidad's still really antiquated in that respect. So you have to bring an expert who says, I was a trained photographer and I did this and I did that and I've done this and I've done that and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, it's an expert. So they have to show how they're an expert, their qualifications and experience. And then it goes in. Now, I haven't seen anything about x-rays to go in there, but I would imagine that they may be able to argue that it is a print. And as a print, it would go in as either a photographic type evidence or they may try and use it under, I don't remember which section it is, a document that was um, created, um, an official document that was created. Um, but it will be interesting. Um, but what I would say is this, because of the way the criminal justice system is moving, I don't suppose for one moment that the police would have difficulty getting it in there. My experience in recent times is that the calibre and quality of magistrates that they have, there are a few really outstanding magistrates. They've brought a couple of them back. 
I can't really name names because what if if I forget someone who's uh, meritorious right. or worthy of mm-hmm. note, I would um, be doing them an injustice. But there are a few magistrates who they've brought back, really competent, skilled people, objective, and um, actually understand their purpose and they know their job and the law. You have a few existing magistrates. Again, there are those who are really, they actually know why they're there. They understand their purpose, their role. They are competent in the discharge of their function. They are good with their law. There's a couple or few. Um, I think of from the top of my head, about five who I would mention without any hesitation has been really, really um, competent. And unfortunately, it's not enough to prop up the system. Not enough. I, I mean, I, I, I agree and I, I, I could point out a situation where I think, um, anyhow, but we, before, I'll point it out before we close off. My thing is, clearly we see in this country where the government, they just implement laws, they do all kind of craziness, all kind of wildness, right? So just imagine, they come and they say, you're not supposed to have a speaker box in your trunk. Right? Yeah. And you pass by the scanner, speaker box, charge. Or no modification, say engine, you know. You pass by the scanner, see a cool air intake, charge. You know what I'm saying? It, to me, it, it, it could get real wild. No, but it's you can see that I t- I'm not someone, as I've told you, who has any real political aspirations or I'm interested in any political party here. But I'm always mindful about criticising political parties because then people have this mistaken belief that mm, you say that but you are in fact a um, hidden or a yeah. closet so-and-so. But you just have to look at what a government does in the climate that it does it. Mm-hmm. And you can't help but criticise. And I've looked at the raft of legislation that this government has brought in. And it's just designed to hit people in the pocket. And it's not as if it's hitting people in the pocket that can afford it. You don't hear... Because policing in Trinidad has a different face depending on where it is. Mm -hmm. Meaning that in some areas... They're there to make sure that those residents are safe and that undesirables are kept out of that area. So they're patrolling those areas with a view of keeping those areas safe. Other areas, they're looking to target people. They're looking for particular people. They're looking for particular things. They are looking to assert themselves. They are looking to make sure that their presence is felt that when they stop, people have to run. Because if you don't run, it's because you're not afraid. And if you're not afraid, it means you don't respect us. So when you look at the laws that the government's bringing in, it's not bringing in laws for the country. It's bringing in laws for certain parts of society. Drivers, this is just the tip of the iceberg. What people don't know that's coming is remember the government's lifting the subsidies for um, petrol, water, electricity, Mm. gas. Do you have any idea where that's going to go? If you're going to let gas prices be determined at the pump, do you have any idea what that means? Do you think Joe Average Mm. is going to be able to buy some service station somewhere? No, you're going to have a monopoly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and those parties, they will decide the price of petrol. And that will affect everybody who drives. Now, a lot of people, as you know, banks are giving people, I think, 15 and 25-year loans or 15 years or something like that for car loans now, things like that. I've heard up the, I think, eat. I've heard up the eat. No, well, I heard recently. And I think with Benz and things, like those high-end vehicles, I've heard they stretch and pass it, but I'm not too sure. (laughs) That's ridiculous. You know, because a car actually isn't an investment. Mm-hmm. Money has two purposes. 
two. You either spend it or you invest it. You know, saving your money actually doesn't do anything for you. Mm -hmm. Money in the bank does absolutely nothing for you. Your money has to work for you. Now, as I said, you're either going to spend it or you're going to invest it. A car is not an investment. It's not an investment unless you're buying a fleet of vehicles and you're using it and you're generating enough to pay off for the fleet and to um, earn more money in order to live and to reinvest. So giving people loans like that makes no sense. Makes no sense. None at all. Do you think the people that can afford to buy a vehicle are taking a 10 or 15 year loan to buy a vehicle? No, they're not. They're not. So you buy your vehicle, you then have to do this ride share and whatever mm. else you'd have to do in order to pay for the vehicle and to live. Parts are expensive. There's a monopoly on parts places already. There's even a monopoly on where you can actually buy cars from. All of that's there in place already. When you start to hit people in the pocket at the pump, the knock-on effect of that is catastrophic. You look at the infrastructure for public transport. Those fuel prices, passengers are going to feel it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's deliveries. That's people traveling to work. That's people traveling generally. So prices at the pump will directly translate to the price of your groceries, because it's going to be more expensive for them to get the deliveries, mm. more expensive for people to get to work, more prices are going to go up. Is the government saying that they're going to raise the minimum wage? I don't remember hearing that. Is the government going to say it's going to give people tax breaks? I actually don't remember hearing that. Did the government say, well, we think that these prices that we have for driving on the bus route and speeding and things like that are kind of prohibitive, so we're going to mm -hmm. revisit... I haven't heard that either. So, with that said, how are people going to live? Well, they might start IT fin and, and because... The number one crime that you're seeing now is home invasions. Mm -hmm. Home invasions are probably the worst crimes. Because if you're not safe in the sanctity of your own home, mm -hmm. where are you safe? If you've driven people to the brink where they're now... Because when I came to Trinidad, you had very few home invasions. Very few. In fact, so few. Um, geez, I can remember. Really, really. You know, it's, and that's where they were targeted. You know, it's a particular person right. for a particular thing. It wasn't just ubiquitous. Now, you're seeing it where these people are driving whole streets. Trying to, because the people are starving. And, and which... To, to your point of when the government do certain things, whichever government it may be in power, when they do it, you have no choice but to criticize it. I've been trying to figure out for the past year or less than a year, why are we removing the tax exemption on hybrid vehicles and then want to switch to pay any price, any pump? When from owning a hybrid vehicle, I see I, I could safely say there's about fifty percent savings in gas. So when people had the opportunity to be saving, I think if you want to remove the subsidy, or because uh, okay, if I need subsidy, government paying too much of the subsidy, then if you have cars that use less gas on the road, they will spend less money in the subsidy. Yep. Right? And why 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 you stop that? Why why not just like I think I, I don't know if England has that, I know for sure. And I think they do. But I know the US has something in place where if you buy an electric vehicle, Tesla, for example, yeah. you know, you get some sort of rebate, some tax yeah, refund. England, 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 England has it as well. They're also talking in terms of pay as you go now, mm -hmm. in terms of carbon emissions. That's, that's what England, mm -hmm. they're muting that now because this whole transition to renewable energy is what they're speaking about. But it's ill-conceived because they don't have a global approach to it. This ad hoc mm -hmm. actually isn't working. There's a very interesting documentary on that that um, if you get the time, you should look at it. And you'll see that in the one hand, they're saying it's renewable energy, but in order to attain it, yes. the kind of damage they're doing to the environment mitigates entirely against the whole notion. Mm -hmm. But people don't know that. You know? Yeah. It's, it's green, okay. 
burn down half a rainforest to make the parts for it, but <laughs> it's green. So, no, I don't... It's ill-conceived. It's, it's the whole approach the government has, this ad hoc um, approach, is if you just sit back and look at it, it, to me, instead of promoting good business so that people are encouraged to invest in businesses, uh, develop businesses, encourage spending, and in order to encourage spending, you have to offer people good employment with, um, I think, a, a wage that is commensurate with the work that they do. So you raise the whole standard of um, community, the whole society comes up. They're not doing that. They're using legislation as a in view, in sorry, revenue uh, um, fest, if I call it that, because anything they can bill you for, for they are, and legislation that's pre-existing. They're hiking up these fines astronomically. Prisons are overcrowded. People are not going to be able to afford to pay it. So you're going to lock them up for non-made payment and you will criminalise people who initially you didn't think were meritous of a custodial sentence, but it's a custodial sentence through the back door. Because if I have a choice between putting food on the table or paying my fine, Am I going to pay my fine or am I going to sit down and listen to the, um, a nagging wife remind you of, <laughs> of your shortcomings mm. and the screaming children um, running around half naked because you can't afford to feed them or clothe them or you're going to pay your fine? You know, you're on your way to jail because, you know, you're going to put food on the table. Mm. <laughs> That's what you're going to do. I'll take one for the team. Yeah. Yeah. But mm. then... I, I could forgive a man all day long who prioritizes his family. Because if you don't look after your family, who will? You, you, do you really want to create this nanny state? Just up the road, that social welfare building. I watched that queue grow with... It's, it's, it's a sad state of affairs. It's a terrible state of affairs. Because you're not looking at people who don't want to work. Mm -hmm. You're looking at people that as a government you are not allowing to work and then you want to um, penalise them with this raft of legislation and these fines when these people can ill afford to eat or clothe themselves that to me is a, a borderline um, genocide, genocide or um, tyrannical type of behaviour mm -hmm. it's it's and again, people are just so accepting of it. And that is what confusing me. I mean, I try to push back, but people, I don't know, some people, they just give up. They just, for whatever reason. No, you, if you put people in a state of fear, that fight or flight mindset doesn't allow analytical dialogue within yourself. You don't really have that reasoning because you're thinking, geez, do I run or do I find? Mm. He's put the fear of God in people. And when I say he, that will be our illustrious prime minister. People are afraid. And when people are afraid, they're easy to manipulate mm -hmm. and they surrender their civil liberties. They Imagine that, you have these x-ray cars now. I wonder how many laws that thing's breaching in terms of civil liberties exactly. and privacy. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. that's not for me to say. Because, uh, okay, so um, I know in the US, if your car is locked, they cannot force their way into that's your right. car without a warrant. That's right. Is that the law in that? I, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Listen, with um, warrants, remember, the police must have this belief that you... And that's the thing about the car part of it, because it's you. Mm -hmm. If you are in the process of committing an arrestable offence, or if you're about to commit an arrestable offence, then yes, the police can intercede. This kind of hot pursuit type of idea. idea. Imagine I'm standing here, mind my be business, Officer Dibble, and I see you sneaking around, and I see you climb over some hedge and break into someone's house, and I say, hey, you, and you run. 
transpires you're the man who lives next door. You run into your house. Can I run in after you? Yeah, it's hot pursuit. Mm-hmm. I just sat down and watched you attempt to break into somebody's house, or I can see you leaving somebody's house with a TV. Yeah, it's hot, hot pursuit. Or I can sit down and I on the other side of the hedge and I can hear you with the boys, right, I'm going to go and break into that house here. You be lookout and blah, blah, blah. Do you know, I can just step and say, listen, lads, coming with me. Other than that, you're looking for a warrant, aren't you? You can't break into my car because my car's sitting down there. You could probably break into my car, for example, if you turn up there and you look on the back seat and you see an AK-47 or something. Those circumstances, yeah, you'd come and wreck the car and or you'd sit back and wait to see who comes to the car. Yes, you could intercede there. But this whole notion of the radar, as I say, Trinidad doesn't have civil liberties here. It doesn't have it. it. doesn't have privacy here at all. I've been to people's houses where you have the neighbour's camera facing into your <laughs> yard. <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely outrageous. Mm. I've even heard of one person that has the neighbour's camera facing their bedroom. Mm. <laughs> precious little you could do about that. Uh, it's, it's, it's a sad state of affairs. Trinidad has so far, it's moved forward under the Manning administration. And you didn't have to be a fan of Manning, but under his administration, I think it's the best that Trinidad has been. Because... For whatever reason, whether it's because he was a statesman, whether it's because he was a visionary. But since then, it's as if Trinidad has just unraveled and spiraled right back down. I agree. I, I agree. I tell people that was one of my favorite yeah. prime ministers. Um, I, I don't know much about Ian R. Robinson, but from what I've heard, you know, he tried. Yeah, he tried. I, yeah. I remember my aunt saying, speaking about him, I wasn't in Trinidad. Then, no. But, I heard about that. I came for the Manning administration. I found him pompous and arrogant. And I would say that those are characteristics one would expect in a leader. (laughs) (laughs) But but be that as it may, we are where we are now. And in this climate, I think it's the ideal opportunity for anyone of the right fortitude to prove their worth. It's not about the the crowd mentality. It's one man does make a difference. Mm -hmm. The only question you have to ask yourself is, you know, are you that man? And the second question, are you willing to pay the price? Why don't that journey? Whether you don't do it, Mm -hmm. there's a price to pay. Right. Whether you do do it, there's a price to pay. Are you going to decide, well, you know what? Which price are you going to pay? Yeah, I'm prepared to pay the price because Mm -hmm. I'm actually... It's it's not as if you're on an aeroplane and it's plummeting into the sea. You have a choice. Do I grab the, um, do I run into the cockpit and grab onto the joystick or the Mm. controls? Or do I just sit there screaming like everybody else in the Mm. black, we're back, we're going to (laughs) die. That's just your choice. Mm -hmm. You can be a passive observer in life or you can live it. I choose to live life. Whatever's going to happen is going to happen. True. But it's going to happen because I will choose Mm -hmm. my path. You didn't let this happen to you. Yeah, I will choose my part. And as this is only dead fish, just go this damn well, go with the flow. Yeah. 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 There's very few people that actually agree with uh, me being outspoken. Very few people always mm-hmm. tell me about, well, you should just not get involved. It's not your problem. You know, if the police kill people, then, you know, that's them. If uh, this happens, then that's them. And, you know, you could always go back to England. And, you know, why are you making it your problem? I love black people. I'm from England and I know. Um, what it's like. And when I come to a country that is predominantly um, black people, if I can't help them, who who can I help? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm here now. I'm not someone who lies down and plays dead. It's not the way my mother raised me. Not who I am. I believe in what I do. I know that for sure. Alright, so thanks again for being with us. The Alternative Perspectives Podcast. Yeah, so that's Mr. Clark Wills, Athenian Law.